So today we have the presentation, close-out presentation from a project we did in Word Package E for Cesar with the University of York, and it will be presented or introduced and then concluded by Rob Alexander, who's a lecturer, and Kester Klecker was the project researcher on this activity. Okay, so the project title is pretty self-explanatory, I think. Automating the search for hazards in complex systems. What we wanted to do was take complex airspace systems and find the hazards, the, way, the, you know, the ways that things could go wrong and cause accidents, without doing any work ourselves and just getting the computer to do it. So, what we'll do today is, I will introduce and motivate. Kester will solve the problem in front of your very eyes. And then I'll say, where do we go from here? Which is a bit of a clue that we haven't totally solved the problem. So, I think we can, I presume I'm not saying anything controversial here, if I say, air traffic management systems of systems are huge and they're complex. We have a huge you know, pan-European airspace with a great number of planes, of air traffic controllers, of support software networks, and so on. The figure I saw was, does this sound right? 30,000 flights a day in Europe and going to double by 2025? The last part is not right. <laughs> <laughs> good. Has it, has it got worse? No, it would be less. That's good. That's good. So, problem. We can add automation to help us cope. Particularly, it can take some of the load, it can make things more efficient, and it can make things safer. ADSB for planes to communicate, SWIM to get the ground stations with you know, unified information. Potentially, if we want to increase capacity greatly, free flight, where we don't need that link between the ground and the air so tightly anymore. Problem. All of these could introduce greater risk. All of these will change the risk behaviour of the airspace. They'll introduce new ways for problems to arise. Or they may just move the risk around. They reduce a problem over here, but produce a new one over here. And over here, we know about it and have mitigations and procedures, and we know where we stand, but this is new. So whenever we make a modification, we need to analyse the effects of this change. And even if it's not any more dangerous per se, any introduced new system adds complexity, and in particular may introduce tighter coupling between systems. Like for example, at the moment, there's relatively weak links between air traffic controllers compared to how they will be, I think, under a swim regime. So, once you've done that, the individual ATCOs are more tightly coupled, in a computer science term, to each other. It makes it more difficult to analyse because the effects of any problem at one place can spread more readily to another. That is almost by the definition of what things like SWIM do. They exchange information, but that provides a conduit for propagating problems in information. OK, so how do we analyse the effects of these changes? Well, a classic one, obviously, human in the loop situation. And a great thing is, of course, you can use your real software interfaces and you can see how people difficult to model things like people, can react to the system. Of course, you've got problems. Obviously, long setup time, high running costs, and crucially, can only work in real time, which limits the volume of possibilities you can get through. And as a system becomes very complex, there are great, it has an enormous state space. It can be in a great many states. There are a great many possible paths of this, then this, then this happens. And you will not be able to explore a great number of them in this kind of very labor-intensive simulation. And this is nothing new. The solution is nothing new either. Solution two, fast time simulation. Obviously less complete, particularly on the human side, because you have to use computer models, but cheaper, more flexible, and can run on server farms in the dark and get through tens of thousands of simulations quite quickly. And there's loads of techniques for getting really good data via designed experiments or you know, Monte Carlo random simulation. Problems. Still very, very expensive to do the, all the computation you need to find very rare events, because in the air, if events going to happen once every million flight hours but cause a catastrophe, we really, really want to know about it. But that's a lot of simulated hours. Traditional solution to that, there is lots of good work. I am on improving Monte Carlo efficiency. I'm particularly familiar myself with the um, Henk Blom, Cybert Strove and the like at NLR, who've looked at lot, obviously lots of techniques for cutting down the amount of runs you need to do to get a given level of coverage of critical situations. And this is a classic thing of do a large-scale do a large scale runs, then zoom in on the areas that seem already seem particularly dangerous. Problem. How do you know where all those critical regions are in a complex system 
with a great many states. Also, big problem, all of these systems are getting more complex, driving more complexity, and making the analyst job harder. It's not going to get easier, certainly not if we want to increase airspace density greatly. So, we know that we have simulations and computers to run them on. We can do that. And in those kinds of simulations, we can, at least for quite a lot of different model aspects and problems, we can vary parameters and modify the, and calculate the risks of results. There are heuristic search techniques, like genetic algorithms, that can take a model with parameters, you know, black box model, parameters in, result out, and optimize so that we maximize, minimize, do whatever to the output. So, could we maybe search for maximum risk? And in some sense, you know, find the hotspots that Monte Carlo might have missed. Kester, could we? <laughs> Okay, so um, we ended up choosing the RAMS Plus ATC simulator. There wasn't a great choice, to be honest, out there at the time. We did come and talk to Eurocontrol about what we could use, and this seemed to be the best. We then went and talked to ISA Software, who produced RAMS, uh, and asked them if they had an API we could use, because the idea is that we wrap um, the simulations around a search harness, so that the search harness repeats m many thousands of simulations. And we wanted to really to be able to have some way of interacting with the simulations as they ran. And I say software did say there was a, an API. Unfortunately, um, the API they gave us was, um, was an early prototype written about 10 years ago for the FAA. Um, it was unsupported, had a, a lot of bugs with it. And we weren't able to make it work. So eventually we, we just had to run RAMs um, as, as it comes out of the box. So that was, that was just a disappointment. Okay, so the approach, the, the idea of using this, this automated search over a scenario is that it's too difficult to manually simulate um, the safety implications of all possible outcomes of a particular hazard, um, particularly when you've got multiple flight paths and aircraft involved. And we thought, well, why not let um, a search algorithm go through many thousands of outcomes and find the worst cases for us. So the idea is we're going to use uh, an evolutionary search algorithm I said to find this worst case uh, to look for an incident. And the basic approach is we take a baseline scenario, we mutate it in some way, and the way we've chosen to mutate is to mutate the aircraft entry times into the scenario. And then we inject an incident into the simulation. I'll talk about the, the, the incident we've chosen um, in the coming slides. So we then examine the outputs and we, we try and assess those for the presence of risk in the scenario. And we, over time, we select the riskiest and uh, keep mutating these scenarios and hopefully we come up with, um, we, we find some novel areas of risk. So for those who are not familiar with how evolutionary search works, if you imagine these are all the different mutants of our scenarios, we run all of them together, we rank the outputs, we select the ones which are the riskiest, and then remutate, create the next generation, and, rep and repeat. Okay, um, the incident we chose was this loss of cabin pressure. This was really after a very brief discussion with ISA Software, who said this is probably going to be the easiest thing to implement uh, in RAMs. So the idea is you've got a plane coming along at um, flight level 330, cabin pressure incident happens, you've got to do an emergency descent down to flight level 100 so you can, the passengers can stop using the masks. And either you get diverted to a, a nearby airport or you're allowed to continue with your, your route at uh, maintaining at flight level 100. We decided it was going to be a lot easier if we just allowed the plane to continue on its, uh, on, you know, towards its destination, but just at a lower flight level. And the way we implemented this was create a special profile within RAMS that mimicked uh, an emergency descent. Okay, so we don't know how accurate that is because we <laughs> there's not that some, uh, much information on it, but uh, we've got something which looks reasonable, we think. Early on in the project, um, we needed to test the, the search algorithms were working, so we created a very simple scenario. We've got these two flight paths here. You can see this is the, 
one which is broadly running sort of north-south, and another one which is running east-west, and they sort of converge obliquely. And at the beginning, they're both running at the same uh, level, so at 3.30, and we just wanted to test that the search outcome would bunch the aircraft up to create the maximum disruption, the maximum work for, for uh, an air traffic controller. So this, is, this is not a realistic scenario, this is just to check that the search worked correctly. Once we were convinced the search was working, we then moved on to more complex scenarios. And this is the final scenario that we ended up with. So this is an en route scenario. We've got um, various flight paths. I don't know if you can see them. They're a bit faint on the screen. There's our two main flight paths. These take about 75% of the, the traffic. Uh, those are t they're both at the, um, I think, one's at 330, the other's at 190. And then you've got some minor flight paths, which are intended to represent sort of incidental traffic light aircraft that's going across the sector. Um, and a small, there's a small percentage of random traffic allocated to these minor flight paths. The, the cabin pressure loss incident is on, injected onto this flight path here. So it generally conflicts uh, with aircraft coming uh, on the lower level flight path across, it, across there. We did some experiments with this and this seemed to work okay and we looked like we were finding high risk areas but um, we weren't convinced. The problem with those rounds you've got uh, an automatic uh, algorithm that, that resolves conflicts. So we weren't really sure how accurately that reflected how a human would perform in, in those circumstances. And we thought it would be fun to add even more work to the air traffic controller and so we came up with the idea of um, a storm moving across the sector. The way we implemented the storm was, um, I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail, but it, it, you can see it here, it's a sort of no-fly zone represented by that polygon that will move at a, uh, across the sector um, in a direction and speed chosen by the, the search algorithm within limits. You know, we don't allow it to go across at 100 miles an hour or anything. Okay, the worst case for uh, the cabin pressure loss, the CP loss, the idea of this is you can imagine I've got our, our plane coming across the sector, it has to do an emergency descent into possibly other flight paths uh, requiring um, the air traffic controller to resolve these conflicts. And what we wanted to say was if the search algorithms could mutate the entry time of this aircraft so it, it sort of would be here or here or further along here, would this create more work or greater risk for the air traffic controller? So the way the, um, the search algorithm works, it, a search algorithm needs to have a sort of a gradual measure of risk. So we had this idea of looking at how safety barriers degrade. Um, it's not a, a hard, sudden uh, switch into a crisis mode. It's a gradual increase of risk. So we wanted to come up with a sort of basket of risk measures that would give an overall uh, fitness score. And the ones we chose, um, this is in the absence of domain experts who could have really helped us with this. We had a, a, a brief discussion with Anthony Stokes and he said they were, they were okay, but we, we could have done with more work and more help on this area. So there's a number of conflicts, which is just a total number, um, total number of resolutions, um, percentage of available separation. This is some kind of measure of the worst conflict. It's sort of the amount of available time to resolve a conflict. So if you've got um, a reduced amount of time to resolve a conflict is somehow ranked as more serious because it shows you're, you know, you're not resolving in good time. In addition to those, we've got these weighted heuristics. So we were interested in um, the amount of extra work created by CP loss. Uh, in order to find that out, you've got to be able to target CP loss to say any conflicts that happen with CP loss we will rank as more important than other conflicts on the, on the boundary of the airspace. So you have, to, you have to wait certain conflicts in order for the search uh, algorithms to target them. And there are also various multipliers to offset certain uh, values within here. So um, this percentage of available separation, for example, is, is something you have to multiply out to make it a reasonable, to give it a weighting within the overall compound fitness score. And the final thing is this uh, NASA complexity measure. I'll talk a bit more in detail about that. This is something we added uh, very late to the project. 
when we, we added the thunderstorm. We weren't sure if adding the thunderstorm really created a lot of extra work. You might see a thunderstorm here moving down the edge of the sector isn't going to create a lot of extra work to the air traffic controller because by the time the aircraft reach here, um, if the storm is there, fine. If it's not, then it, they're easy to divert and then they get passed on to the next sector. So the air traffic controller is not that bothered. However, if the storm moves this direction, opposite against the, the main uh, flight path, it's going to create a lot of extra work for, for the air traffic controller. We wanted an easy way to sort of say, well, is the storm, the presence of the storm, adding greater complexity? And RAMS comes with this work they did for NASA. So they've got this thing they call um, a complexity measure, which originally tended for this dynamic resectorization algorithm. So there's a tool which will dynamically resector um, a, a sector so that you, you can divide the work between air traffic controllers. And the tool is supposed to do that for them. However, you can set it up for a single sector within RAMS, and then you're just going to get a, a score that says, minute by minute, what was the greatest complexity of that sector? And we simply took the greatest value and said, okay, you know, we add, we'll add that to our, our, our basket of risk measure. Whether this is true or not, whether greater complexity equals greater risk according to these, these measures, you know, aircraft count, aircraft density, structure, climbing or descending, CPA, all these things, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a domain expert. So you can take that as you find it. It, it was an easy thing for us to implement, so we thought it was worth adding. So the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of the search algorithms. The basic algorithm is a simple genetic algorithm, as, as I've explained. And if you know anything about evolutionary search, there are literally thousands of variations of, of genetic algorithms with all sorts of claims about size of population, um, the different types of uh, mutation schemes or crossover schemes. We decided not to use crossover because um, there's no good way. Of, so for those who don't know, you, you represent each scenario as, a, as a, a set of genes, if you like. Now for us, all we're doing is mutating the entry times of the aircraft coming into the sector. But if you employed a different technique, such as crossover, uh, you'd have to find some way of chopping a scenario in half, if you like, and joining it onto another scenario. And it, so that was a much more difficult thing to implement. And we didn't feel the evidence was good enough to justify all that extra work. It was a lot easier for us to choose mutation. And our results suggest that the, the gradual mutation of entry times was, was, was adequate. So how does the algorithm work? It's, it's very simple for those, probably I don't know if any of you are familiar with these things. It's called a random hill climber and it basically samples near, near neighbors. So let's say we've the dark red dots here are the random samples, then the algorithm will generate a mutation of that scenario within this boundary. Now that boundary for us is um, a mutation time. So we don't allow the, an aircraft to say, you know, if it's coming in at 15 minutes, we don't say, okay, this aircraft can now come in uh, at 35 minutes. That would mean this boundary would be huge. Instead, we restrict the size of the mutation allowed. And it makes a big difference, this, to how well the search algorithm performs. If you allow that, that circle here to be very large, say 300 seconds, you'll get this sort of performance. Now what this is showing here, this is our fitness score, and this is the, the, the increase in risk, in the, uh, the sort of average level of fitness of the, of the population. Uh, we, I think we're using a population of 100 different scenarios, and each of these scores is showing the, the top 10, either the 10 riskiest scenarios out of that population. So the, this is the number of generations along the bottom here. Now the plateaus, are um, the best scenario of each generation is passed on to the next generation unmutated. Okay, so you can see here, we've got this, if this is the best scenario, you'll get some mutations, and if nothing is better, then it's just passed on, so you get these sort of flat plateaus occurring. Now what's interesting at the beginning, you can see there's lots of mutations that are, that are fairly close to, to the, the best scenario, but over time, each mutation is performing less well in a sense and it's not really improving 
uh, the, the best scenario. And as you get to the final here, the gap between the average fitness of the population and the best scenario is very big, showing that each mutation is basically failing to improve the amount of risk in the, in the scenarios. And if we go to a, a smaller circle, um, a smaller mutation range, we get a much better level of performance. Now, why is that? So let's have a look at what's actually happening. As I said, this is the, this is the, if you like, this is the amount you're allowed to mutate the entry times into the scenario. If you make this very big, what's happening is that your mutations are then going to basically find it difficult to hit this peak. What you've got to imagine for, for us in this scenario is that our peaks are really, really thin and narrow, very, very small. What you, you've got quite a gentle uh, peak of fitness there in the, in the population. So if I mutate this a long way, I'm going to fall outside. I'm going to make all these are, are getting worse. If you make a small mutation, you've got a better chance of moving up and, and finding the optimal, the, the optimal point in, in the search space. OK, there are quite a few issues we found with this approach. Um, probably not, not so interesting for, for you guys, but as a generic approach to, to searching for risk, there are quite a, few, quite a few things you probably need to think about before you start a project like this. One is that you can create these scenarios with high risk scores, but they don't always point to a specific incident that will exceed any sort of safety margins. And what we found when we first started was that if we didn't target um, the incidents or the conflicts with CP loss, the search algorithm would find a whole bunch of conflicts on the edge of the airspace, rank those highly, and CP loss would just be forgotten about. And, um, and that's something we, we only discovered about halfway through the project. So we, we realized you had to have these sort of targeted heuristics. Now, obviously, if you target a part of your search space, there is a risk that you're going to miss an incident happening somewhere else. So you have to weigh those up as, uh, you know, to think, what is it we're after? Are we trying to cover the entire search space, or are we going to focus on something specific? And we don't mind if we miss something on, on the periphery. The other problem is, is that if you've, if you've used this compound risk measure, what have you actually discovered? Because one of the problems with the compound risk measure is that lots of things get bunched into a single measure of risk. So what, what have you found? Because each simulation is, is lasting two hours. So you've got, then got to go through the simulation and look at it and see what it is, that why it's got that risk score. And again, you've got to say, well, you know, have you, have you included the right things in your compound risk measure? What did you miss? Because there is the possibility that you might have just discovered an extremely rare configuration. You know, the sort of configuration that was, you know, a, a, a unique combination of aircraft entry times that would only occur once in a million years. So have you found something that's worth finding? Because, you know, an air traffic controller so might say, well, the chances of that those aircraft all coming in at just those times, one in a billion. You know, frankly, it's never going to happen. Um, or perhaps you know, you're, you're in a neighborhood where there's lots of configurations like that. Now, the problem with the technique when we started is that we didn't know what we were finding. Were we finding a unique incident, or is, is there perhaps many others around by? Because you only get one final solution using a search algorithm like this. So we said, well, that's not very useful for air traffic controllers. We need perhaps a bit more information uh, surrounding the result. So we said, well, how can we find this? What, you know, what is the answer? Have we found this just one single incident? Or are we looking at, uh, we have, we found one incident, but in the near neighborhood, there are some other areas we also you know, we ought, to, ought to look at. So we wanted to find a solution to this. So we, we call this you know, trying to find some context to the solution that the search algorithms have found. And you know, the reason we thought this was, was basically useful for, for safety analysts is that you know, for most people, when they're implementing these safety barriers, they use this simple formula to say, well, what is the cost of the outcome? And multiply that by the event frequency. So if you've got a very, very rare event, such as a mid-air collision, but it's extremely expensive, if that collision happens, it causes an enormous amount of work and effort. Uh, there's a lot of you know, investigations and stuff you say, well, the cost is huge of that incident, then it's worth implementing a lot of barriers to prevent that type of incident from happening. And that's the kind of formula they wanted to find. So we said, well, if that is the formula, we need, we need more information around the results we're, we're finding. So 
finding that context is actually very difficult. The stage two scenarios were far too large to search exhaustively, because that would have been the first, that was my first approach, to say, okay, well, let's, let's just go through the search by brute force and find every possible uh, bad scenario, and then we've got all the information we need, and we can work out what we found. But it was too big. We couldn't do that. So then this, the, the next answer was say, well, how can we, is there any way we can find um, information about the event frequencies? And I thought there must be some relationship between um, the times the aircraft come into the sector and the likelihood of CP loss coming into a conflict with them. Because um, I, I thought that there has to be a relationship. You know, if CP loss enters the sector, it takes a certain amount of time you know, to cross that sector. If there are aircraft entering more or less, at a, you know, proportionally uh, to the same time CP loss comes in, there must be a relationship. But we applied um, linear regression, trying to find um, a relationship. We also were going to look at principal components analysis to try and find that relationship. But we couldn't find it. I'm not saying it isn't there. I'm convinced it is there, that relationship, but we couldn't find it in the, in the time we had. And we didn't have the sort of statistical expertise to really go into a lot of detail with that. So the next approach was to say, well, how about we, we extend this idea of the near neighborhood and we do some extensive sampling. So this is basically the brute force approach, but applied to a small area around the search result. So let's imagine we found, our search has found this, okay, and it's the that's the near neighborhood. We said, okay, well, let's, how about we extend that and we'll do a brute force, a random search around the wider neighborhood just to check that um, there aren't any similar incidents nearby. So we get some, some notion. Again, if you make this too big, then you're going to start to find other peaks that are not related to the incident you're looking at. You know, again, this, the size of that, of that circle is something you have to determine yourself. Okay, so let's have a, have a look at how that works. This is a, a sort of typical search run. Again, you can see the sort of gap at the end there is, is quite large. Um, so basically every mutation of this scenario, the best scenario here, is, is falling generally pretty low down. We then create um, an extensive sampling around the, the best scenario. And what we've done here, we've done 5,000 samples uh, around the final result. And lo and behold, if this is the fitness score of, of this, so it's just coming straight across. Lo and behold, you do, we do find some scenarios that actually have a worse risk score than what the search found. So that was interesting to us, so we were quite pleased to, to find this. And then we thought, oh, okay, so are these very similar or different? I oh, know, so we then sort of had a look at some of these and, and analyzed them in detail. And um, we, did, we did a few of these. And it seems to be, you can see some, some literally only find a single result worse. It really depends on, on the type of scenario you're looking at and the type of thing you're focused on. Okay, one of the things is that some, sometimes the variance might be very, very close to the the scenario you found within the search and other ones might not be. So uh, we think this is, it, this is an, uh, it's a nice approach. It's an approach that's probably going to have some practical use for, for air traffic controllers looking at safety because you can use the search to find um, the initial high-risk scenario and then you can use the intensive sampling around that result to try and find any near variance. And the near variance might be simply a question of different aircraft times or they might have, you know, perhaps another incident uh, of some sort um, in the, in, in the neighbourhood. And once you've found your variance, you can then look at these parameterized uh, groupings of entry times that create the risk, and you can run more results around those. So disadvantages with this sort of two-stage search process is that, obviously, you have to do one search run, find a high-risk scenario, then, in effect, you have to do um, another search run using the intensive sampling around that result. So you effectively double the length of time to do this process. Now, for us, a search run would take about 36 hours to run on a normal desktop PC. So we'd leave it running overnight. 
If you do the intensive sampling of the, of the second stage, you would add another 18 to 25 hours, say. So you're looking now about five days of processing time. Not on a, on a very powerful machine, but it's still quite a long time to come up with the result. You can play around with those figures depending on how many samples you take and things. So it's, um, you know, and how big a, 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 you know, a, an area you choose to intensively sample. We found that choosing the size of the neighborhood was problematic and it, you, I suspect you would need some sort of domain expertise to work out how big of uh, an area you wanted to intensively sample because if you make it very big you start to include um, high risk scenarios that are not related to the the final search results you found and then you say well you know this is involving conflicts that are not in the original one so it's really a different scenario yes it's another high risk scenario but it's not part of the one we're, we're focused on so you've got to decide how big you make that that second stage that, that's really the, a summary of, of what we did for the project So, Kester has summarised what we did and how far we got. ASHIC search can use risk measurement in air traffic simulations to automatically discover certainly high risk situations, to maximise some compound risk <coughs> score in the way that Kester demonstrated. And then we can also, by weighting those risk scores to make some factors more important, we can focus on specific incidents or we can not. Another thing we can do, of course, is before presenting the results to a human analyst to look at, we can unweight those scores. So it can provide the real risk measures but the, where the pop, for a set of runs where the population was biased by, say, favouring CP loss. So what can we do with this? Well, obviously, model proposed, says our systems and regimes, and analyse in this way. We could do that. There is also some interesting similar work involving the EEC and University of New South Wales at Canberra. Um, there's uh, people involved, Hussein Abbas and Sibi Alam at Canberra, Stephen Kirby at <coughs> here at the EEC, and several others. And they take a similar general approach, um, evolving ATM simulations to find bad ones. Particular ones that stand out in their published work are one where they're evolving to how do we maximise delays at, at an airport by evolving both the traffic patterns and the various failures on the ground and working out what factors are most significant or potentially most significant in causing those delays. There are also, they also do work on finding, for a given situation, what's the worst thing the controller could do here? And they search for that, much as we search for what's the worst set of arrival times. ASHIC's is predominantly applied, we have to safety analysts, where safety analysis, based on, there's a couple of words missing there, based on the overall risk level for a scenario, which, as I understand, the Canberra works mostly not so far to address this. And they've also emphasised, mostly, no, actually not in that um, searching for the worst, for the, when searching for their worst... The delays use the current version. Yes. The arrival times use the standard GA. No, you, when you say arrival, do you mean the, um, Sorry, the control, risk? The oh, yeah, highest control of risk. These are similar GA approach to us. But they've also you looked at co-evolutionary work whereby they co-evolve the failures on the ground, so that's one population, and the arrival patterns in the sky. So in other words, they might have a population of 50 or 100. They are, these are possible arrival scenarios. And a population, probably smaller sizes than that, actually, but a similar sized population of scenarios on the ground, and they play them off against each other, trying to first the worst combination, and trying to evolve the pressure of evolutionary pressures, say, on the arrival patterns is, the fittest individual will be the one that causes the most problems when applied to the, pop the different popul the population of failures on the ground. So, where forward on this? It would be good to empirically compare the ASHIC's approach with the standard GA and our basket of composite risk measures with something based on the Canberra work, particularly some kind of co-evolution. You could certainly co-evolve configurations of systems or of controller role allocations or indeed sectorization with traffic patterns. Almost having a kind of, here is our response in terms of controllers, systems and so on, and sectors. On the one hand, that's our one population. 
and here is the stuff we're trying to control, which would consist of aircraft with their particular arrival times, routes, and pilot behaviours on the other, along with some stuff like weather, which is, again, stuff that happens to us rather than stuff we control. In terms of protocol for doing the empirical comparison to work out which approach is best, I would suggest we take a set of models with known hazards where it is known that under these conditions the workload can become in quickly intolerable if this and this happens, and testing which approach is quicker to find them in an automated way without using any kind of weighting as a hint, i.e. working without knowledge, specific knowledge of what causes those hazards. And it's likely in some ways there will be elements of the two approaches that can be fused. A problem which affects us and affects Canberra equally. What confidence do we have? Question. When we've analysed using a search, or multiple searches more likely, a model, have we found all the risk hazards in that model? I mean, leaving aside fidelity to reality, just within the airspace model we found everything that can go wrong and all the causes of them at the level of the model we're analysing. Because safety analysts and safety engineers can only do so much with just, here's a bad thing that can happen. Obviously, if we say this and this happens, then we could get an intolerable controller workload. And you can put in mitigations to say, we don't, okay, we will not sectorise like that. Okay, if the weather starts to look like that, we will bring more controllers online, split the sector, etc. But to make a decision about what measures to introduce, we need more information. Neither ASHIX nor Canberra can give us accurate event probabilities or frequency because of the way they analyse. So how can we, A, justify the cost of a risk measure, or B, trade off against other activities to say, oh, we need so much effort to spend on an ASHIX-like analysis, rather than spending it on Monte Carlo, spending it on any kind of manual analysis, and so on. Well, as Kester pointed out, ASHIX does start on the way of a partial solution, but it's only partial. Because the two-stage process not only finds high-risk scenarios, but also through the analysing the context around the really bad incidents we found, we provide partial context. So safety analysis can analyse the high-risk variants, which gains confidence <coughs> that stage one has perhaps found something real. And they can also look at the groups of high-risk scenarios created by the context analysis and say things like, what is the f probability of us reaching this group around our really bad scenario in the whole search base? Because a point scenario, you can't really assign a meaningful probability, but a space within the parameter space, you can have a go at assigning a probability to that. That's plausible. What it can't tell you is it's slightly more nuanced, what is the probability of getting that scenario or anything that is causally equivalent to it? Because in terms of the model and the model's parameters, there might be one bad scenario here with this space around it. We would find the bounds of that space, or certainly could. But there might also be something that is causally equivalent, would be the same once you understood it and explained it properly, which is, in terms of parameters, is over here and is about this big. That context analysis would not reveal this case. And that's something that Monte Carlo analysis and experimental design approaches are generally very good at. Beyond that, I'm not sure. However, one idea. A Monte Carlo approach finds an overall picture and general risk patterns, whereas an ASHIX approach, or indeed the Canberra approach, searches outwards from high risk points. We can take a point and say, find neighbouring scenarios. Indeed, beyond the context analysis, we can seed the search. This isn't something we particularly implemented, but we can seed the search with the initial population of, say, where all the individuals are this high-risk variant here, and get it to search around that. Can you find anything worse? Now, you could take a Monte Carlo analysis and result and say, these high-risk high points appear here, 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 and here. Are we pretty confident those are the general location of high-risk points within the scenario? How can we get more confidence? One, we could take an ASHIX analysis starting from each of those points and see what we can come up with. If the search finds nothing worse, it looks out in all directions, tries a wide variety of parameters in this local space, and finds nothing that's worse than the original one found by Monte Carlo, then we have increased confidence there is indeed, indeed nothing there. 
if search does find something worse, it moves, Monte Carlo is here, it wanders off over here and finds something absolutely terrible, we have to, we not only have we found a new risk source, possibly a new risk source, certainly a new peak worst risk, but we've also decreased the confidence we have in our original Monte Carlo analysis, which is not a comforting thing, it is not what we want to happen, and it will not help, say, push our new, the project we're developing, say, or the change we're working on into production, into operation, but it's better to know than to not know. How much would this, any given instance of that, increase or decrease the confidence, and how would you put a, no, a number to that change? I don't know. That's going to be tough. But I think this is an idea that has legs moving forward from here. Okay. I think it's time for questions. So I open the floor for questions. You've taken one scenario and you've done an automated search. The whole thing is like the human analyst cannot analyze the search space. We need to automate the search, but still you need seem to be able to have to tune the search quite a lot by looking at yeah. Yeah, the yeah, neighborhoods yeah. and so on. So there is still yeah. an analyst's intervention. So how yeah. far have you now automated the search for, for the risk assessment? A better title for this work would have been, I think, semi-automated search for hazards in complex systems. And I think that's the way it needs to be. There's not that much advantage in absolutely automating every aspect of the process, but making this stuff is much more useful as a force multiplier, allowing an analyst, I, think I suppose at Monte Carlo, is rather having to program each individual case, you simply describe a scheme for varying runs as you do multiple random runs. In the same way, this is a way for describing, I want you to conduct this kind of search. I don't want to go through it mentally myself or by typing in individual instructions. Because now, if, if you look at a certain airspace structure, you want to do a risk assessment, and you've, done, you've looked at CP loss as an incident, but you can think of many other events yeah. that cause yeah, yeah, yeah. incidents. Oh, yeah. oh, we want to have several scenarios yes. to demonstrate yes, it. Uh, but but we th there you don't provide any help. I mean, you still need to have these scenarios proposed no. by safety yes. analysts. Uh, so I think your starting points and general conditions, yes. I think you've got to... Um, You've got to remember that setting up the scenarios is a major part of the work. That's a, that's a big part of the work. So you've got to have the domain experts in place to help you set up scenarios and decide what it is you're going to focus on. But that's still a weakness of the safety analysis. The things you haven't thought of might still happen, yes. but you ha haven't Basically, calculated their risk. That, if yeah. there are factors and causes that you have never thought of, actually literally elements in the simulation that are not modelled, aspects of, say, aircraft behaviour that cannot occur in your simulations, you haven't modelled them, you think they're important, Yes, this can reveal nothing, nor can any, certainly any fast time simulation do this. But you can... It shares the same limitations. You can run the scenarios without any weightings. But if then you'll find, you'll, you'll find whatever risk is in the airspace. Yeah. I mean, you might get two high-risk scenarios, but they're completely unrelated. I think that's the problem, is that what, what do you end up with as a result? You know, because at some point you've got to say, well, what is it I'm focusing on? This point was having... Yeah. Lots of high-risk scenarios that are not related. You, you know, safety well, needs to work on a certain part. And but say, we can, okay, they can that be separate. That is something you can do as post-processing, of course. We wanted to focus on getting the simulation to very efficiently get to some interesting thing, so we did a lot of hinting. You don't have to hint. It just means that it will take longer to find a given result. More computer intensive. Had we had more compute power, I think we would have done less waiting. I still think you need to wait... Um, if you want to look at a specific incident, because otherwise the search algorithm will just get distracted. Yeah. If you wait all, One thing you all <laughs> conflicts equally, the search algorithm will find conflicts in a part of the airspace that you're not really interested in. It will just generate those. Um, so you've got to decide what it is you want it to focus on. Yeah. And if you don't have any preferences, you don't need to wait. Another thing you can do is apply multiple waitings. Die, repeat the search several times, with multiple waits, or even different fitness parameters entirely in an attempt to find different kinds of problems. Choosing your um, fitness function is always a, a difficult area. Because it's very easy, if you choose the wrong fitness function, for the search algorithm to find the wrong results. That's, again, you probably need some domain help with that. In terms of the sort of balance between automation and human effort, I suppose it will end up being similar to, as we have the current Monte Carlo approaches. It should be thought of in that space. It's a slightly different approach. Rather than doing Monte Carlo, as well as doing Monte Carlo in some combination, 
you apply a heuristic search technique which will be strong with slightly different things. And I think that for as complexity of systems increases, as it inevitably does, and we want to for all kinds of reasons, this, technique will, this kind of technique will be a valuable supplement to traditional Monte Carlo approaches. But there is, to make that really work, there's work needed on how you would justify the result, the coverage you had achieved from this. And that's a really thorny problem. So I can understand the sort of frustration you've expressed about only getting kind of halfway through the project, really, because you've, mm. you've, you've worked on the, uh, the the methodology and the, uh, the search and all that kind of stuff, and obviously spent a lot of time setting up the uh, simulation and test and um, But were you able to, to draw any conclusions that will actually produce any results in terms of de scenarios that were particularly risky, or, or did you make any observations as to um, configurations of flights or whatever that, that that you can actually say something it's, about? It's hard because we, we have the results, but we don't have the experts to come look at them and say, hmm, that looks bad, mm -hmm. you know? Because you would need an ex we would need somebody who had the expertise to come and say, well, you know, what you found there is realistic or, or not realistic, because we, we can't make those judgments with what RAMS does. So RAMS will do certain conflict resolutions, for example, that may or may not be what a real human would do in that situation. And people who actually use rounds a lot, they configure how certain aircraft are resolved. So for example, one of the things we wanted to do was to say, if you've got a conflict with CP loss, always resolve the other aircraft. Don't resolve CP loss, because CP loss is in, in emergency, it's going to have its emergency descent, so leave CP loss alone. So that was the only scripting we did to, to resolve the, um, the way the resolution algorithm works. But people who know a lot about RAMs, they could they could really play around with those and, and really, you know, decide how conflicts are going to be resolved around a particular emergency aircraft, say. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have that expertise, so we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And also we couldn't really judge the results we found because we, again we're not domain experts. So I think today we're more interested in showing we've got a, a technique, a search technique that can find high risk scenarios. We've got a way of providing context to the results that we found, that, so that domain experts then come along and look at the, the, the variance and say, yeah, there is a pattern here, you know, within these parameters that our aircraft coming in that is, they all seem to cause the same type of problems, and those problems are realistic. Now, if obviously, if we had people who knew what they were doing set up the scenarios, I hope they would find good results, but we can't say that because we're not domain experts. We're just providing the, the search algorithm expertise. I think the general model to look at this is, this is just like a Monte Carlo simulation. Expertise needs a little input to build the models. A expert guidance is needed during the search to, in between certain runs of the search in order to guide it. And expert guidance is needed to process the results. What the search does, it does an awful lot of the number crunching in a more structured, not more structured, but a more intelligent way than a Monte Carlo or experimental design search does, um, approach does. And the search also can prioritize scenario outputs in terms of interestingness. And some, to some extent, although internally the fitness is used to go into search, externally the fitness is a cue to the analyst on the far end what is interesting. And it's possible to have separate the fitness function used by guiding the search from the objective function, which is the thing of interest to the analyst. You could take both methods, guide the search by including weightings, as I described earlier, and have the output used to guide the domain expert, safety analyst, or whatever, be the raw risk factors, which means that the top elements of the population might not be the very highest possible ones in terms of this objective function, but that they will be you know, clearly denoted by the level of interest. So, so you got this. You got a ton of results, but you're not quite sure what to do with them. But is the project actually providing that data so that somebody can, in a form that somebody can go back and have a look and uh, and interpret it in some way? I don't know. Um, so what do you? Uh, I, I don't know how good our scenarios are. Yeah, we don't know how. We, we need somebody to come in and say, you know, so for example, the flight paths. And we were discussing this with Dan just just before the presentation. We implemented. Um, a forced separation of aircraft along those flight paths of 120 seconds. And the pilot here always said, well, why did you choose 120 seconds? That seems far too much. 
But we didn't want to generate any conflicts uh, that were simply caused by aircraft being too close to one another on the same flight path. Because well, we didn't trail separation of 120 seconds. Yes. That doesn't sound like much to me. Is it? it makes 15 or 18, 16 miles. I, I chose <laughs> but for us, we thought though that type of conflict wasn't particularly interesting because that's the kind of conflict you can predict. That's not something that's very interesting for research to find. One thing is that we found early in the uh, in the process that that particular configuration of ram them all really close together in trail was very attractive to the search algorithm. It very quickly saw, ah, I can do this, fitness, fitness, fitness rises. And we looked at it and saw, and this is an example of what you were saying, we looked and saw, no, that's not interesting. So we added these rules to, to, to constrain the search so that it couldn't do that. Well, we first, thought, we thought the conflict of aircraft, of each other. aircraft you know, crossing each other's flight paths is more interesting than a conflict generated by an aircraft getting too close behind another aircraft. Mm -hmm. We didn't think that was so interesting. But that's just a limitation we, we put in. But again, I don't know if that's accurate or not, or having lots of aircraft following a particular flight path is accurate or not. I think in reality, probably an aircraft controller would spread them out in parallel if you thought there was a problem with aircraft getting too close. You see, there are so many things we didn't know. But I think, I think the main thing... There are some things programmed into RAMs already, presumably, some... some uh... if you, so if you look at the scenarios where the storm goes up against uh, the oncoming aircraft, it does that. It splits, up them, splits them up um, into parallel Mm. sort of tracks. But I think, you know, this is getting away from the main point. The, our work really isn't about the quality of the scenarios we produced. It's more about the search technique. And the viability of the search so technique on plausible scenarios. We assume that if established. people wanted to right. take the technique forward, they would provide the domain expertise. Which with from, an academic, from an academic perspective, that's great. But when you're, when you're talking to the people we talk to, we have to do a bit of explaining as to exactly sure. what's going on. Because well, that's why we wanted more domain expertise yeah. through the project. Sure. We would have liked to have somebody there every month helping us with our scenarios. And, and one of the things we've, we've spoken about, actually, in, in later calls is actually making sure that uh, a project is a combination of academia and uh, operation expertise yes, and, and yes, make, that. forcing uh, that kind of consortium. We, we didn't it, yeah. do it, actually, in the last one, but for the most part, uh, we, we have, have very this. few isolated uh, mm. universities, actually, yeah. in our second Where are we going so. forward again? We would be looking at working, probably, we would probably approach ISA software and I would also like to work with NLR on this, as I discussed, in terms of combining their Monte Carlo expertise or something like this. Mm. They have obviously have lots of existing models. Or oh, Hammer. Potentially, yeah. yeah. Mm. But that would be more on the, perhaps more on the solution side. Mm. Mm. Oh, you could have done that. The second call, you could have had Canberra and David in that fashion. Mm. Yeah. I think that would have been interesting. Yeah. Well, we couldn't have paid for Canberra. It isn't exactly. Uh, it was possible actually. We changed the we changed the requirements so that became possible. Okay, we didn't know that. Okay, more questions. Time. Um, maybe I'm asking a irrelevant question. I'm not a software engineer, but I just wanted to know. And uh, this is an initial stuff, and you mm. just and you are aiming for this program to a safety analyst. As a tool, yeah. As a tool, yeah. yeah. And you just take into consideration right now the combination of adverse weather effect and a CP loss. Yeah. For the next works, can can a program can be written that takes into account everything? For instance, if I want to uh, assess the combination of low visibility conditions plus runway incursion. And the runway incursion, I think rounds will do. I mean, it really depends on your simulation yeah. environment. Simulation, it's basically, basically, the answer is, in theory, yes. In practice, everything you do will create a more complex simulation engine in a more complex... I don't know about the the I don't, I'm not sure RAMS would do that, does it? Uh, but uh, is that, is that is question? something they're working on with it's the SAA. RAMS or, um, in, in theory, all of this can be modelled. The quest, obviously, the more things you try to model, the more complex your model will be, and therefore the greater difficulty you'll have validating the model. Which isn't for this kind of approach, is not if you're just using it to find possible hazards, not worrying about probabilities, that's fine. You can have a dodgy model because you're going to find prob if you, if it comes up with an unrealistic hazard, you will be able to spot that later. But it will increase the amount of wasted effort of it generating a scenario, analyst going through it and realizing no, this couldn't happen. That's the main cost. As you add more complexity to the models, 
you would also have probably greater computation time. I think you, you can do anything within what RAMs will let you model. You know, we, we had no idea really how to get the most out of RAMs. You know, if you go into RAMs, let's say you've got all these rules you can affect, and um, we just took everything as, at the default values. And again, the profiles, you can affect the profiles. So if you wanted to create a plane that was, you know, had engine failure or something, you could probably design a profile to do that. Or you could, you know, plane that suffers comms loss or something like that. You could probably simulate that. But, you know, that was really beyond our level of expertise in terms of the domain and what we knew about RAMs. RAM, the main manual with RAMs is pretty much useless. It just tells what the menu options does. <laughs> It doesn't explain the domain at all. And that was the domain that we found the most difficult part of the project. What would have been really nice for us, when we started, we, we said we we're going to have four stage scenarios, and we only got to stage two. We had stages three and four, which were, by the fourth stage, we were looking at uh, a terminal area with multiple climbs and descents and you know, runway incursions, and we never got anywhere near that, you know, because creating that sort of scenario just impossible for us. Uh, in these timescales, you know, we would have had to have another person working just on creating the scenario. But once the scenario is created, you can take any scenario and plug it into the system. So it's so it's applicable. Yeah, you could do whatever you wanted. You know, it's just you, but it, uh, it's a lot of work setting up the scenario. I think that's the issue. But that's well, the case whenever you use yeah. a fast time simulator. All this technology does. It does this technology doesn't help you with the modelling whatsoever? All what it does is help you to explore those models which you've got. Uh, halfway through the presentation, you, you said you were looking for a relationship, but you couldn't find it. You, you thought it was there. I, I didn't quite understand that. But what made you believe that there was something there, you could, no. but you couldn't find it? Well, there's there's really a regression a white board here. But I mean, if, if you if you just think about it, planes enter the sector. As they as they enter the sector, there must be a relationship. If, they, if the flight paths cross, there's got to be a, you know, a relation between the times they enter and the likelihood of them coming into conflict. If I've got planes coming in here, and either they come earlier or later, there must be a sweet spot where they come in and they're going to conflict. It has to be, in my, my way of thinking. But I couldn't find that relationship. The likelihood of them uh, colliding. Yes. Well, the likelihood well, of conflict. We, we didn't do really, you know. Yeah. No. Well, the whole thing was about reducing the search space, and if you have this law, you wouldn't have to search everywhere. You could just yeah. search in yeah. with using this formula within a certain subset. If we, if we knew, the if there was some way of say, taking a scenario, looking at the entry points, looking at the results you've got, you should be able to find that relationship. Then you need, only need to search around that that bit to generate the worst cases. But we yeah, so find do it. you have an explanation why you could find what you? Thought no, should be no. Easy to find. I mean, we 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 well, just didn't get good results. We were going to look at this technique called principal components analysis, um, but it required a lot of transformation of the data. We got a guy in who knows about that stuff, um, but it looked like a lot of work, and he wasn't convinced we would find anything or yeah. wouldn't find what we wanted to find. I mean, I've heard that bef before in another context. Uh, are you sure it's not some kind of nonlinear? aspect of this whole thing which means it's well, not one of the problems yeah. yeah my feeling is that if you could have we could have found such a relationship it would have meant that problem was too simple to need the kind of techniques we're using mm. those heuristic search techniques to my Possibly. mind are for those problems where you can't apply the simpler traditional statistical techniques I mean, PCA, calling pca simple is a bit weird but it is a much more it is a much better analytical tool where it's applicable than this kind of search is but it may well not be applicable. Part of the problem was the, the distribution of aircraft uh, on the two main flight paths was random. So you could have just a single plane on the north-south flight path and all the other aircraft on, on, the other, on the other flight path. And that makes that sort of principal components analysis quite difficult. That, that was the problem. And so we, there, were, there were too many factors that might affect the, the that possible relationship. So, that, that's what we think was the problem, but we weren't able to really explore it. Anymore. Yeah. We did a sort of simple linear regression, and we looked at a couple of variants of it. We didn't find it, and we thought, going the extra step and doing the principal components analysis looks like too much work. We're not guaranteed it's going to work anyway. And so we just backed away from it and said, there isn't time on the project to really explore that anymore there. And again, certainly if we could have found a, a relationship through linear regression, again, it suggests that that particular 
scenario. No, better, it's not best addressed by similar techniques. I mean, to my, head, to my mind, there must be a relationship, but it was just... But it may not be, because the, the relationships that linear regression can capture are quite limited. Yeah. And the problem is this random distribution. So it's, it's actually very clear. If I've got three aircraft here and 15 aircraft there, it's quite different to having seven aircraft here and you know, eight there or whatever, you know. That's, that's why it's difficult to get that, the exact parameters for the highest risk. And also, if I've got seven aircraft, what we did was say, the CP loss was always on one flight path, just to make the calculation simple. In a more complex scenario, we're saying, well, CP loss can occur anywhere in the airspace, um, but that required a lot more work to, to implement. So, so we said, oh, let's keep it just on one flight path, and we'll say it could be any aircraft on, on, on that particular flight path. And if there are only two aircraft, then it had to be one of two. But if there are 15 aircraft, then it would be one of 15. And all of things, all of those will affect the probability that there's going to be a conflict with another aircraft. Do you see, do you see the, the problem? Mm -hmm. it's Have you applied this to any other uh, field other than air traffic control? No. Uh, specific no. Technique. We did um, submit to Gecko and EvoStyle, which are the two main evolution research uh, conferences in Europe. Uh, Gecko is American, but it's, it was accepted as a poster in both of those, so I think there was some interest. Yeah, in terms of it as a novel approach, yeah. In terms of what we want to, want to do in the future, this is a lot of application for tentative further aspects of software testing, particularly, I think, in terms of our mobile robotics, where, again, you're, you want to produce situations which are difficult for, rather than being difficult for the semantic controller, are difficult for the actual robot to control code. This would obviously have applications to UAVs, given a simulation and and UAV control software embedded in the simulation, trying to give it airspace situations in which it does something dangerous or weird. Any further questions? If not, I would like to thank you thank for the presentation. Thanks for looking at